All right, Ephesians chapter 2, if you would. And let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer before I forget it. And, um, man, I love this. I love, I love Ephesians. There's a lot of good stuff in it. There's some, there's some weird stuff that I'm going to get to in this book. I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm not going to try to hide anything. Uh, there are some wonderful good things in here. There is beautiful, deep doctrine in here. Um, but there is the Bible in Ephesians is desperately trying to teach us of a realm that we know nothing about. Okay? Um, and, it, and it will, if you'll, if you'll believe the Bible, trust me, um, you will be the wisest people on the whole earth. There's a, there's a man that calls our ministry uh, every week. And um, I like to give him, uh, if I can, just a little bit of my time every week. He has, he suffers with severe uh, depression, um, schizophrenia. He is on a disability. Um, he does uh, work at some places where they let people who are disabled work. Um, but he calls me and I'll tell you some of the things that he comes up with out of the Bible. I'm going, that is awesome. That's good. And it, it goes to show you. He, and he always talks down on himself. I know I'm not very smart. I'm not this. I'm, not, I'm going, I'm listening to you. Good grief. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. The Holy Ghost has. And um, it doesn't take a genius to believe God's word. And it doesn't take a genius for the Holy Ghost to pour things into you from the word that enlighten your eyes and enlighten your soul. And you will know things that the rest of this world will never be able to grasp at. Never be able to. Simply because they don't know the Bible. I watched a, uh, I started watching a video yesterday afternoon until it just, I couldn't take it no more. This guy was one of these UFO know-it-alls and he knows uh, that the whole hidden truth behind why we're here on this planet is all contained in the ancient civilizations and they all had it down right and all the religions of the earth get it wrong. He said, for instance, they translated the Bible all wrong. I love it when they tell us that. I love it when people who don't believe the Bible tell us that they translated the Bible all wrong. And this guy knows nothing about Hebrew or Greek or nothing like that at all. But he said that it doesn't say in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He said there's something left out of there and it actually translates out to um, before the beginning they created the Elohim. Elohim is God. Okay? And I'm going... Well, you got the first verse of the Bible wrong. It's all downhill from there, bud. Okay? Uh, but they're out there. And people, people believe they fall into that stuff, I guess, because... I guess because mainstream, organized, factory-produced Christianity doesn't, doesn't reach them. And I can understand that. I can understand that. Uh, but there are true born again Christians who love the word of God, who may not think the way the assembly line churches are taught to think and believe, but they believe the Bible way. And buddy, you can't fault them for it. I think God will show those people and that generation things that the Bible seminaries and the scholars will never figure out all of their life. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now that John's here. Father, we do love you very much. We thank you, God, for uh, this beautiful afternoon you've given us. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and the privilege of standing, Lord, here in front of all these people that are gathered with us, both here and online, around the world. I pray, God, that you would bless your word uh, as it is already blessed. It has already blessed us in ways that we cannot even explain nor describe. It abides in our heart. It works in us and does things in us that we could never do ourselves. It reveals truths 
that the world will never be able to comprehend. And Father, I just thank you for this book. Open it up to us. Open our eyes up to it, our hearts and our ears. Help us, dear God, to not be like those who have ears and don't hear and those who have eyes but don't see. Help us, Father, to be those who, when you say verily, verily, we believe it. And Father, just give us knowledge, give us understanding, give us wisdom out of your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, now, who remembers from 15 minutes ago what I said the theme of chapter 2 was all about? 15 minutes ago I said it. I said it 15 minutes ago. And you're already like... Huh? What your life used to be? Does that ring any bells in anybody? What your life is now. Okay? So, let's, let's look for that. Uh, I know we're going to end up uh, somewhere around verses 10 or 11. So, we'll read down to that. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You are quickened now. That's your life now. You were dead in trespasses. We're in a time past. That was the old you. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had, we used to, back in those days, had our conversation in times past, um, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That was the old life. We were under wrath and appointed under wrath. Uh, verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when, back then in the old life, when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. That's the new life. That's where we are now. We're living by grace. Anytime you read the Bible and God shows you something in that verse or in that passage and you're just like, that is so wonderful. And you just get goose pimples all over you and tears come out. That's God doing that in you. That's God putting that in you. God is showing you something that while you were lost, you would have never... Never considered that. Never even thought of that. Um, I, I like having former Catholics here. Because you sat under a re the religious machine. And the religious machine of Roman Catholicism turns out all these cookie cutter people. Everybody has to be exactly alike this way. And don't deviate from what we tell you to do. You lived under that. Apparently, it did not satisfy you. Apparently, it did not give you the answers you were looking for. Apparently, it didn't work. And you realized it. And so you said, you know what? There's got to be something better out there than this. Okay? And I just don't like the way that priest shakes my hand. Man, that's just ooey. Amen! Amen! Never know where that thing's been, all right? Verse uh, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I, I believe, and it's kind of based on this, but I kind of believe that when you and I leave this world, the rest of the world's going to go, Whoa. I think God's going to do it in the sight of every man. Uh, that to me would be verse 7 in a nutshell. That in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God's going to take the worst people in the world, which is us. And we're now saved by grace. And he's going to lift us up off of this world and, and bring us into heavenly places with Him. In verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. That We covered that uh, this morning in the message. 
Uh, these are verses worth memorizing. For by grace are you saved through faith. The two components of our salvation, and they both must be present. And we talked about this, so I'm not going to spend a long time on it. God's grace must be in your life, allowing you to even be saved. Number two, your faith and trust only in Christ must also be present. You can't join Christianity and then join six or seven other religions and say, I'm just making sure all my bases are covered. You can't do that. God's a jealous God. If you want to join those other religions, fine. There was a guy that he, uh, I think he's still around. He wrote a, a couple books on his life when he was in the occult. And he simultaneously was a uh, 33rd degree Freemason. He also was a Mormon simultaneously. He also was um, a New Age practitioner. He did meditations and things like that. Uh, he also, by that time, was into vampirism. He was literally drinking. And he, he starts one chapter out and he says, there's nothing in the world like waking up in the morning with a craving for human blood in your mouth. I don't want to know. I don't want to find that out. But he was simultaneously involved in all of these, in all of these practices and all these ways. By the way, they're all joined together. Because he was searching for this one truth that he felt would launch him into being one of the ascended masters or something. They would give him eternal life and immortality in this universe. Um, and it took, uh, I think the woman at the bank, just out of the blue, said to him something to him like, I will pray for you today. Apparently she detected something in this guy that was not of Jesus Christ. And she just said, I'm, I'm going to pray for you today. And he said, that changed. He said, that made me angry at first. But he said, the angrier I got, the more um, under conviction that I got. And finally, he says he gave his life over to the Lord. Now, um, verse 8 again, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Some people have it like, uh, boy, when I get saved, God's really going to have somebody on His hands He can really work with. I used to agree with a lot of people that, boy, if God could just save, you know, some of these movie stars, if God could save a bunch of these politicians, if God could save, you know, some of the kings and queens around the world, if God can save a lot of these sports stars that everybody looks to, boy, we'd really have it made for Christianity. But when you look in the Bible, that is not God's plan. He's not called many rich, many powerful, many wise in this world. He's not called very many people like that at all. He said, I've, I've chosen the baser things to bring down the things that are high and mighty. I've chosen the foolish things of the world to bring to naught the wisdom of this world. That's how he does it. He does not pick the celebrities. He picks the people who are of no real status in this world. Um, my social media numbers are nowhere near what some other people's is. But I don't care. Because I figured God over the last several years has been carrying the things that he's given me to all these people, why don't I just trust Him to keep doing that? I don't need to have a million followers. If I got that, I would get a big plaque from YouTube, but I'm not looking for mine anytime soon. But He doesn't. He calls us who are nothing in this world. Simple people, simple-minded people to give us the great things of God. Uh, so, uh, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And mentioned last week that everybody who has a work salvation boasts. Everybody does. Um, very quickly, go to Galatians chapter 1. And I'm going to 
since he brought up um, not of works lest any man should boast since he brought that up uh, I'm going to identify for you the way you could recognize if, if what somebody is giving out is the real gospel or not uh, in Galatians chapter 1 uh, Paul told us this in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And he says then, which is not, he says another gospel, but he said it's not really another gospel. The word gospel means good tidings. Um, that, that, the phrase used by the angels, we bring you good tidings of great joy. We're bringing you the gospel. And he, and Paul said it's really not a gospel because it's not good news. It's bad news, bad tidings. But there would be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say it I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, I believe, uh, and I've shared this before, but I believe verse 8 is spot on what's going to happen. It's already happened. It already has happened. They've, they've had a practice run. Several times already. Joseph Smith received another testament of Jesus Christ from an angel. The angel Moroni. Okay? Um, all of these... Uh, I'm reading and studying these so-called uh, Virgin Mary appearances. They're called Marian apparitions. The uh, Virgin of Guadalupe. And that story. And the event that took place... Uh, in Lords, the um, the Fatima uh, apparition, and so on, and there's something that is links all of these Marian apparitions together. In that, in almost every one of them, this Mary thing is telling these people, pray the Rosary often, as as much as you can every day. Pray the Rosary. Um, uh, don't sin anymore. Stop sinning. And I want you to build a, uh, a shrine unto me in this spot so that people may come and contemplate me, Mary. Well, she's a whore then. Because that's what whores do. Whores sell themselves. Come and she didn't say... Worship only Jesus Christ. Pray to Him. She didn't say that. So, right here we have an angel from heaven bringing another gospel. And that gospel is a gospel of works based. If you pray the rosary enough, then many graces will come to you. And that's another phrase that Catholics use. They use the word graces. And what that means is... Um, oh, I'm trying to remember one apparition. The Virgin Mary um, made this uh, medallion. And she said that whoever wears this medallion will receive special graces from me. And what that means is, Catholics believe, that if they're wearing that medallion that they will be forgiven of more sins than somebody who's not wearing that medallion. A lot of guys in Vietnam, Gulf War, World War II, Korea, they were wearing St. Christopher medals. Why? They thought it would protect them. So, how many guys on Utah Beach and Omaha Beach when running out with St. Christopher medals and were gunned down before they ever got out of the water. Didn't work, did it? But that's what they're told. Do what? Really? Oh, I'm sorry. But they're telling people, where, where, pray these rosaries or have these rosaries on you. I've seen people come to a, a, a funeral of somebody that wasn't Catholic and before anybody's looking, lay a rosary in that casket while they think nobody's looking because they believe then that that will save them. It's too late. 
It's too late. But they don't believe that. So, to the degree now that you add a work or a performance of man's ability, that is the degree that you don't have the gospel anymore. In fact is, all it takes is one work. And you already don't have the gospel. The gospel is given to us plainly in scriptures, uh, defined to us that it is absent any measure of ability that you and I have. Because sure as the world is today, if one guy can do that, there's always going to be somebody else in the world who can't. So what if, what if paying the, the, the Vatican or what if paying the church $100,000 gets your Uncle Freddy out of purgatory and gets him in heaven? What does that say to the people who don't have $100,000? And they've got a five-year-old child that died. And the priest tells them that child is in purgatory and will burn in purgatory until enough masses are said to get her out of purgatory. And that happened to a family that we used to have a daycare back in the 80s. And we had these two twin girls. They were five years old. And her and her older brother was playing out here on CC Highway. And uh, their dad had pushed over a bunch of stumps. Well, they were playing underneath one of those stump, those stump wads. And the thing fell over on the brother and, and her and killed them both. And that priest told that grieving mother, because your daughter wasn't baptized as a baby, she's in hell. And my mom said, I wanted to kick his teeth down his throat. And she tried to tell this lady, ma'am, don't believe that. Don't believe that. I don't know, I don't know what age anybody is in uh, the, the age of accountability, but I think if she was innocent, she's in heaven. But work salvation are always by some religion to put some sort of yoke of bondage on you. To get something out of you or to make sure that you don't cross their teachings or go against their teachings. Because if you do, you will not receive uh, heaven. I, I said that at the beginning, uh, this morning was talking about David Koresh. That uh, there was one man who survived from the, the fire itself. He was there the whole time. His name was David Thibodeau. And, uh, he got pulled in by Koresh. He joined their group. He could have left at any time. In fact, he wrote in his book that he asked David, David, can I go? David said, if you go, because uh, David Thibodeau had fallen in love with this girl that Koresh had already married. She was 12 years old. She was older now that Thibodeau got there. And there was a love interest there. And he asked David, he said, can I take her with me when I go? And he said, absolutely not. That's my wife. And it's just a big, oh, it made me so angry. But that's what kept all those people inside that compound. They could have left at any time. I'm not, I'm not removing blame from the FBI or the BATF. They botched that horribly. But the fault was on both sides. And that was never really brought out the truth. But those people could have left at any time. But because they were told that they would go to hell if they did, they stayed inside there and burnt alive. So... It is by grace you are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, verse 10. We are his workmanship. This is how we are now. In times past, uh, remember, in times past, in verse 2, we were being led by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But now that we're saved, we are his workmanship. Now, I want you to ponder what this means. Because um, just over the years of... Of hearing, uh, hearing some some ideas out, studying the scriptures, I am convinced that God is at all times sovereign. That there is never a time 
when God is not directly in charge of Mike Hoggard. Not a time. Never. I read that verse to you the other night. Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph. Now, on my worst day, I could look back and go, I don't see how God was triumphing there, but he was. God was using that time in my life to conquer and destroy some things that I had in me at that time. God knew exactly what I was doing, where I was going. God knew exactly that and he used that to destroy that in me. Does that make sense to everybody? So, if I say to you, we are his workmanship, does that indicate to you that there are times when we are on our own and God is not working in our life? No, it basically destroys it. I, I do. I believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. He is always in charge of everything at all times. There's nothing outside of his control, his command, his governance, his authority, his lordship. Nothing. Nothing is. Even, even when we go astray, well, go back and read the Old Testament. God used Israel going astray to bring Israel back to their knees where they needed to be. Okay? I mean, he was always there at every time they, they went astray. God was always there and he worked it. He did it. He allowed it. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, I will say that God gets a lot of glory out of the good works if we don't take the credit for them. And we're bad about that. We're very bad about it. We do something good. We read our Bible. We pray. We feel like we've really accomplished something. And all of a sudden now we start pinning medals on our uniform. Boy, look what I did. Boy, look at I, I did this. I did that. Then we start telling other people what we did. And, in, and I would say in a lot of cases, that's just... Braggadocio, that's an old word they don't use anymore. It is you boasting on something that you had nothing to do with. God did it. God did it. Um, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Before what? Before the foundation of the world. God already has seen... Your past, your present, your future. It's None of it is a mystery to Him. None of it... There's not anything that happens that God says, Now wait a minute, I, that wasn't on my list. What are we going to do about this? None of it. God sees it all. God knows it all. It was prepared for the foundation of the world. Now, does that exclude our choice? No. Clearly it doesn't. Because I don't remember my mom dragging me, kicking and screaming down to the altar that Monday or Tuesday night at Camp Niangua when I got saved. I was the one that asked her if I could. And then I went and asked God if I could. I had decided at nine years old, I do not want to go to hell. And I believed... What the preachers were telling me. I believe the verses that they were giving me. I believed them at nine years old. And God had already foreseen that. God foresees me standing here now. God foresees what I would be doing next Sunday, the Sunday after that, the Sunday after that, the Sunday after that, so on and so on and so on. And He sees all the outcomes of my life. So I am truly His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. And they have been ordained since before the foundation of the world. Now, verse 11. That's our life now. Now look at verse 11 and read the first part of it. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past. There it is again. The old life. Remember the old life? Gary, you remember the old life? 
Okay. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, meaning the Jews call us the uncircumcised. We call them the circumcised. And really all that means is, is that we were uncircumcised Gentiles. They were circumcised by the hands of man. But that's it. Does that save a Jew? No. Never did. Never will. It's like water baptism. Okay. Uh, Everett wants to be baptized. So we're going to baptize him. Okay. The water's not saving him. He's already saved. If he dies now, he's going to heaven. Okay. But in verse 11, that's in times past, we were the uncircumcised Gentiles called that by the circumcised Jews, but it was all in the hands of man, in the flesh of man. Verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens. Ooh, the word aliens is in the Bible. And what does it mean? It means, stranger, we weren't born a Jew. We weren't born in Jerusalem. My daddy was not from the tribe of Judah. I got I to gotta share, share a blessing. Okay, I may not get done tonight, but I'm going to share this blessing. Somebody sent this to me. I don't remember who it was. Okay, but I, I've just been looking at this here lately at just how ornately it's designed. And this is the the Old Testament. And look, it's even got pictures. That's my kind of book right there. Okay, and it's got the Hebrew here. and It's got the King James Old Testament over here. Okay, I forgot that along with sending me this, there was a smaller book, about like this, about this size. And I found it. And the gas station that Lisa and I go to every morning, or me now, <clears throat> she doesn't get soda anymore. I'm the only one drinking poison in our family, apparently. Um, I stop in there every, every morning. They know me. I like to cut up with them. There was a lady in there. I won't give you her name. But uh, she kind of she kind of managed the morning crew and everything like that. And, you know, I, I like to make people laugh. OK, just make people laugh. And um, so she I said something one time. Um, I, I was just kidding around with her. I think she was shorting me change or something like that. I said, that must be the Jew coming out in you. And she said, actually, I am a Jewish woman. I went, oh, are you really? And it's like, I stood there froze going, a Jew, a Jew, wow, a Jew. And um, so anyway, I just kid her. She went on to become like the general manager over several gas stations. So she went there for a long time. A couple weeks ago, she was in there. I said, well, good morning. How's my favorite Hebrew doing this morning? She laughed. She thought that was funny. And then I found... The book that goes with that. And what it is, from what I can figure out, it's like a, a little prayer manual with scripture verses in it and Jewish prayers in it. Written in English and Hebrew. And it's got the same design on it and it's backwards. And I got to looking at that thing and I'm going, I know somebody that would probably like that. So I stuck that in our car and I waited. And sure enough, she was in there last week. And I walked in to fill my soda up and she was standing there. I said, don't leave, don't leave. Stay right here. I got something for you. And she's like, oh, what has he got? So I went back out to the car and I got it. And I walked in. I said, now, do you trust me? She said, yeah. I said, stick your hands out and close your eyes. So she did. And I laid that in her hands. And she started looking at that and she opened it up and she started seeing what it was. She started bawling right there in the store. She said, where did you get this? I said, somebody sent it to me. She said, this is probably the best thing anybody has ever given me in my life. She said, can I hug you? I said, yeah. And I've been praying for her. 
uh, at some, I asked her, I said, do you know what tribe you're from? She said, no, I never looked into that. I said, do it because Jacob gave a different blessing and a prophecy to each one of his 12 sons. You find out which son you were born under. And I said, that's your promise. I said, it's in the last two chapters of Genesis. So I don't know if she'll look, but plant the seed. Plant the seed. She may wonder why this Gentile preacher has anything to do with this Jewish girl. I'm waiting for her to ask. Because then I'm going to tell her, my Savior was one of you people. And he didn't just die for me. He actually died for you first. So pray that I get the opportunity. Amen. So I do think you can catch a lot more flies with honey than vinegar. Amen. But who's interested in catching flies? Amen. Anyway, uh, you pray for. Her. Uh, so we, we, I'm a Gentile. I'm an alien to everything that the Jews are. I don't keep their, I don't keep their feasts. I don't speak their language. I don't know their customs. I don't know anything. I'm an alien to that. I'm a stranger to it. I was not born under that. And yet, that at the time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Commonwealth basically is a, a nation. A commonwealth of Israel. And I like the word commonwealth. That the nation, any good commonwealth, will be all about the security and the prosperity of all of its citizens, not just a few of them. Amen? Common wealth. It doesn't mean communism. It means that the laws are set up so that everybody is treated equally in the eyes of God. And that everybody has ac access to the legal system, the justice system, the financial system, that we don't push anybody out simply because they're not of kind. That's what a commonwealth is. That's the meaning of it. So we're not part of that commonwealth of Israel. We're strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope. And without God in the world. That's But now. Look at it. In Christ Jesus. Ye who sometimes were far off. Are made nigh by the blood of Christ. It didn't, it, thank God it wasn't a ritual. Okay? You know what I'm talking about. Thank God it didn't have anything to do with that. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ that makes me, the way God sees me now, is the way He sees someone in the tribe of Judah, or Gad, or... Simeon, or Naphtali, or Manasseh, or Ephraim. Verse uh, 14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one. Now what is that talking about? He is our peace, who hath made both one. What are the two parts of the both? Jews and Gentiles. Okay, I actually have that written here, Israel and Gentiles. And that's, sure, absolutely. He has made us the same as the Jew and how he sees us. And, if, and this, is, this is my biggest thing against people who are replacement theologians. If God breaks his promise to the Jews, where does that leave us who are not Jews? We're trash. We're the dung heap of the world as far as God is concerned. But if God keeps all of his promises to the Jew first, he'll also keep them to the Greek because he hath made Jew and Gentile one. One, actually it says uh, in verse 15, we'll get there, made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There's no separation now. The Jews, and this is what, Paul, remember, this is what Paul jumped Peter in public in front of everybody over. 
While Peter was there with the Gentiles, he was breaking bread, sitting next to the Gentiles, eating with the Gentiles. As soon as the Jewish believers came in, Peter jumped up, ran over to the Jews, the Jewish believers, and said, yeah, these Gentiles, I don't know where we get them. Acting like he's not defiled by them. And Paul said, I confronted him to the face. You know, Peter, who was the first pope, without, without any error whatsoever in his doctrine, Paul said, I almost, I almost knocked him down. I confronted him to the face. He said, Peter, you're not right. You come in here sitting with the Gentiles when the Jews aren't looking. Then the Jews get here, you run over to the Jews and act like you don't want nothing to do with the Gentiles. Who do you think you are? And, uh, and I love the fact that at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, it wasn't Peter that made that call. James had more to do with it than anybody. James said, we didn't keep the law, why we make them do it? Well, let's just say that all of us believe, therefore we're all saved. So is there any wall now separating us from those Jews who believe? No, there is no law. There's no wall there. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself, in Christ, of twain one new man, so making peace. So, here you have Jew... And Gentile and at some point uh, I don't know exactly how or when but at some point Christ is going to make us all part of the new man so that in the thousand year reign we reign with Christ we reign with Israel and the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem is there going to be any difference between Jew or Gentile in that kingdom? No, absolutely not. All the same. God is no respecter of persons. You believe that one? Well, we need some more of that preached. And more of that lived out and more of that believed uh, I'm not saying just get along because people ought to get along. I'm saying that if they're saved, they ain't no different than you or I or anybody else. Doesn't matter if they're Jew, and it doesn't matter what kind of Gentile they are either. If they're saved, they're part of God's plan for a new man. Just like th there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem coming down, there's going to be a new man that's going to abide in these places. God's going to populate all of them. Well, I can't even imagine what that's going to be like. Man, to, to just try to think of a place that exists without time, without the passage of time. We can't even consider it. Because all we know is that what I said just now, I said it 15 seconds ago. And it's already gone. And what I just said a while ago is already gone now. It's time. But we cannot fathom a place without the passage of time. So we can't even conceive of how this is all going to play out. And we always play these games like, you know, I know heaven's for eternity, but what are we going to do for eternity? Your question is moot. It's dumb. It's that there's going to be the passage of time in heaven. And there's not going to be. Explain that to me, Pastor Mike. Sorry, I can't. Time for you to go. Let's stand to our feet.